I've always been sort of a knowledge freak. I mean, I was a very weird kid. Well, yeah, but how much time have you spent loaded? That's the important question. To go from birth to the grave without ever encountering DMT is, to my mind, like going from birth to the grave without ever having a sexual experience. It means you skated through life. You never got it. And, I mean, I think of the mainland as Blade Runner land. It's uh, amphetamine land. It's availability land. It's strontium-90 land. It's newt land. It's, uh, you know, a, just a, a horrific scene. Uh, you know, it's not like camping in cornfields waiting for flying saucers. If you camp in the cornfield and take six dried grams, uh, it will find you. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> and yet, clearly, I'm some kind of cannabis-smoking lunatic. So how did that happen? Well, it's just the principle of the idiot savant, I think. We are beginning to embed ourselves into a, a cultural membrane of some sort. You know, t a 10-minute DMT, DMT trip is worth 20 years of academic pharmacology, art history, <laughs> psychology, and all this other malarkey. Because then you just say, okay, I got it. I got it. The things I encounter uh, that I call elves or gnomes, it's just a gloss. I mean, they're small. And they have the archetype. They, they're more like leprechauns. And this maybe raises a racial issue. Uh, <laughs> and they, they make things. And they live in domed spaces. And you know, the mythology of elves is that they live under hills and they're master craftsmen, m makers of jewelry and machines and stuff like that. That is exactly the deal. And they're, and they're dead souls is what they are. Interestingly, the whole notion of fairyland is uh, when St. Patrick arrived in Ireland to convert the pagan Irish to Christianity, they were practicing what is called the fairy faith. They believed in in little people. They believed they were the souls of the departed. They believed they were everywhere around us and they believed that certain people who had the eye could see these fairies. And they believed this with such conviction that Patrick quickly realized that he was not going to get anywhere converting the Irish unless he made a place for this phenomenon. So he invented purgatory. Purgatory was invented by St. Patrick. It was not church doctrine before that time. And he then, very success. And, and if you are not Catholic or don't truck in this domain, you may not know, what purgatory is, is uh, a place exactly like hell, except you eventually get out. And, and uh, it's where you do penance for your sins. Well, he was so successful converting the pagan Irish with this concept that when word reached the Holy See, the Vatican, uh, it was made church dogma, and then it was very successfully used to convert the pagan Slavs, who also had a belief in a kind of fairyland. Uh, so, I don't know what this thing about dead souls is puzzling to me. It, it, it even with my predilection for the peculiar and the psychedelic, I find it hard to completely embrace the notion that these are ancestors alive in some other dimension. But in some ways, that is the most conservative explanation. After all, if you believe they're extraterrestrials who came from the stars, then you're supposing and hypothesizing all kinds of things. Since they are interested in human beings, since they can converse with human beings, since they seem to know our boundaries and limitations, they must be some kind of human being. And then the choices are they are 
a prenatal form of existence, in other words, souls that never incarnated into a body and are like up there waiting for the stork or something, uh, or they are some future state of humanity where apparently we no longer have bodies and we've changed ourselves into self-dribbling jeweled basketballs for God knows what reason, (laughs) or uh, they are post life forms. They are people who once walked the earth as you and I do, but have gone beyond into this other circumstance. One of the things that is, to me, almost as puzzling as the elfin nature of the DMT encounter is that after you've been in there four or five times, and it takes a while because at first it's just absolute shock and disbelief, I mean, you bring very little out of it. You're just appalled, and that's about all you can say about it. But after a while, I realized uh, that the, the motif of the DMT encounter, and I guess I should describe it briefly, when you burst into the DMT space, you have the impression that you're in a domed space, approximately the size of the length of this room, but round, with a somewhat lower ceiling, indirectly lit, warm, comfortable. And the moment you get your bearings, they're there. In fact, as you break into that space, they cheer. And some of you may know that song by the Pink Floyd from years ago, the gnomes have learned a new way to say hooray. So you break into this space. They scream their greeting. And while you're just trying to get oriented, they come bounding forward, uh, uh, somewhat like dogs, actually. And, and they begin to lick your face and crawl all over you and jump in and out of your body. And, and they say, we love you. We love you. We, you send so many. You come so rarely. Welcome, welcome. And so you're like... You know, trying to take your pulse, trying to make sure you're breathing, because you really, you have the impression, this is so serious that I may be dead. I may have just simply killed myself (laughs) ten seconds ago, and, and this is what's happening. They use their voices to make objects. They speak a language which you do not hear, but which you see. You not only see it, you feel it. And so they, they use language to cause syntactical, architectonic, techno structures to condense out of the air. And when they, sh- and they show you these things. They're proud of them. They come bounding forward and jump up and down in front of you and say, look at this, look at this. And they're all competing like children to show you this stuff. And as you, direct your attention into one of these objects, you see beyond any power of contradiction that this thing that they're showing you is impossible. They're constantly transforming themselves in the most amazing way. Mm -hmm. And they're showing you this stuff and they're saying, do what we're doing. You can do this. Use your voice to make something. And you're like... You know, this is now 30 seconds into this experience. (laughs) Reality has been obliterated and you're just in this place. Well, uh, and and one can do this. And there is a glossolalia. And then these objects condense out of the air. And the objects themselves are somehow alive. You put one down and they, they emit sound and make subsets of their own type. And all of this is just, you know, you're just like, my God, what has happened? Uh, the strange thing about DMT is it doesn't affect your mind in the ordinary sense so that you're not ecstatic or freed of anxiety or you're exactly who you were before this started happening with all your neuroses, fears, doubts, and you're saying, you know, is this all right? Am I going to be okay? It, does it? How long is it going to last? So forth and so on. 
But the point I wanted to make that I got started on a few minutes ago is after many of these exposures to this, I have realized, and I think I'm right, that this environment into which you are catapulted, bizarre as it is, it is someone very strange. It's their idea of a reassuring environment for a human being. They are as mar- they are so marvelous to you because you've never seen anything like it. But on the other hand, you've just been born into this world and trying. And and this is why I think perhaps it is a bardo, perhaps it is an after death. Uh, I don't know if maternity ward is quite the phrase, but it's uh, it's uh, it's where you start your existence in this other dimension. But in the same way that a baby lying in a bassinet in a maternity ward could hardly conceive of growing up to drive Ferraris, collect art, and crush the competition, uh, <laughs> you lying there in this nursery, in this, in this playpen, how can you extrapolate what lies beyond that space? Because clearly the entire space has been prepared for baby, and you're the baby. <laughs> So you can't figure out, you know, is this the entirety of this universe or how far does it extend? And I I suspect that when you die, this is what you get and that familiarity with the after-death vehicle, that DMT actually is a thanatoptic compound and that this trip is you are peeking over the edge into eternity and, you know, Questions you never thought you would have answers to are answered. Just, you know, is there life after death? You bet. Next question. Uh, On that note, uh, let's go to dinner. Thank you. I don't consider myself Catholic in reflex and I'm trying to be a good anarchist, and I lean toward the idea that man is perfect. But reading about a group of people who absolutely believed and acted this out uh, pushes you up against it. Because, you know, if man is perfect, theft is all right, murder is all right, murder of your own children is all right, on and on and on. So then you think, well, then, so... Hmm. So apparently I don't think man is perfect. Well then, so where do I draw the line? Let me say to the group, as far as Amanita and Muscaria is concerned, don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> uh, I mean, this it's, you, you know, out there on the edge of the bar dough. As I say, I'm, I, I don't think of myself as a guru. I think of myself as a doorman. Uh, I don't, I should make it clear, you know, I don't believe this stuff. The future evolution of mankind is going to be based on these states, but the, the last point I want to make is one about how evolution occurs. It isn't that a mutation happens and it is confers greater adaptability upon an individual and therefore that individual and his offspring uh, uh, numerically gain over competitor uh, individuals of the same species. This is not how it works. The way it works is you have constant uh, mutating of a gene pool from the influx of cosmic radiation and other factors. There is always a uh, low level of mutagens, uh, of mutants in a population. But they are of no consequence as long as the selective parameters remain the same. But when the selective parameters change suddenly, these individuals who were previously masked in the general population, the selective advantage that they have now comes immediately to the fore and they act very quickly and critically to send the evolution of a given species off in a different direction. This is why uh, the fossil record progresses in fits and starts because sudden shifts of environment 
cause the apparent emergence of new types. It isn't that they cause it, it's that the new types were always there, but not with any advantage. It's that the new situation has conferred a sudden advantage on them, and they are moving then into positions of uh, dominance in the population or the society, if we're talking about human beings. I think that the psychedelic experience is like that at the present level. It has conferred, uh, there is a population of different people in the general population. And as conditions change, these people will be seen to have uh, adaptive advantages uh, without being metaphysical about it. An obvious adaptive advantage is uh, what I call the deconditioning effect. That, w- that we live in a jungle of propaganda, you know, buy this, believe this, wear this. If uh, if you have a symbiotic relationship with a deconditioning agent, you're much uh, more likely to thread your way through that with your soul and your bank account intact. So uh, <laughs> this is this is one way of thinking of it. That what the what the psychedelics really do, I think, is release us from cultural machinery and put you right up against the human essence. And say you no longer have to pretend that you're Scotch Irish or Witoto or Jewish. You can actually explore the human modality independent of the inertia of these exterior labels. And so it places responsibility. It uh, raises questions of validity, existential uh, 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 honesty with oneself. And I think it promotes. Uh, the moral life, which I don't think happens if you buy deeply into myths of the tribe, if you're a devoted practitioner of Marxism, fascism, capitalism, I don't think these things will lead you to the moral life because they are not, uh, they don't arise out of experience. Experience is everything. These are drugs of experience. Uh, it's very important to take the moment seriously, uh, reincarnation and all these things aside. What if this were your unique opportunity to unravel it all and not to uh, be caught in dissolution? Because I think that there is, uh, there is a potential for immortality, but it isn't assured. It is something which comes to the courageous. So I submit to you that what we represent is a fifth column, a fifth column that represents the best aspirations that human community is capable of, a fifth column that is willing to look at the structure of the psyche in contrast to the the mess of society and willing to dream I'm reminded of William Faulkner in his Nobel address. He said, man will not simply endure, man will prevail. Now, of course, he should have said humanity, but this was years ago. But the thought is there. We have the tools, the intellect, the will to create a caring global culture. It isn't going to come without a recognition of the power of the psychedelic experience. The psychedelic experience is the birthright of every human being on the planet. It is as much a basic part of each and every one of us as our sexuality, our our national identity, our consciousness of self. And any society which attempts to hold back or impede this dimension of self-expression, when the history of that society is written, it will be called barbarous. The movement toward legitimizing psychedelics I see as part of the broader movement throughout human history that gave us the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, women's suffrage, 
In the future, it will be unimaginable that governments once regulated the substances that people use to explore personal growth. It is the mark of a barbarous culture. And we are here to raise a light to say truth is not so easily swept aside. One doesn't just say no to truth. <laughs> truth... <laughs> truth requires engagement. It requires courage. It requires a sense of where we have been and of where we are going. And what is preached all around us is the quick fix, the fast buck, the temporary solution, the throwaway and disposable culture that ends up throwing away and disposing of human lives. And what we place against that is a humanism that does not rise out of theory. It's a humanism that rises out of experience. The experience that informed the great mystics of every religion is not something that we strain for throughout a life of self-discipline and self-subjugation. That isn't it. It is our birthright. Each of us, Dr. Hoffman and his discoveries, place this dimension within the reach of all of us. Dr. Hoffman and his discoveries place this dimension on a social agenda that cannot be denied, that will not wait. If not now, when? If not us, who? It's that simple. We are moving now, I think, unfortunately, into yet a darker political night in terms of the larger society around us. And I make an analogy to the coming of the Dark Ages. But what the Dark Ages promoted that is going to work in our favor were monastic gatherings of like-minded people who preserved information through the time of darkness and social ignorance toward a new day when it could be utilized to mitigate the suffering of men and women everywhere. LSD is, to my mind, first and foremost, the greatest medical discovery of the 20th century, and I use it in the sense of ameliorating pain, creating caring, promoting unity, healing not so much of the individual psyche, although certainly its impact in that dimension is tremendous, but ultimately as a deconditioning agent, allowing us to move beyond the confines of historical society to see what we could be, what we have been, and what, in fact, we have the energy to be in the future. Thank you very much. Okay.